The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann R. Wies. Chapter 7, Part 1. The first thing to be done on the following day was to return to the calabash wood to fetch the sledge with the dishes, bowls, and baskets we had made. Fritz alone accompanied me. I desired the other boys to remain with their mother, intending to explore beyond the chain of rocky hills, and thinking a large party undesirable on the occasion. Passing through the wood of evergreen oaks, we observed our sow feasting on the acorns, evidently not a whit the worse for the fright we had given her the previous day. In fact, she appeared more friendly disposed toward us than usual, possibly considering us as her deliverers from the jaws of the savage dogs. Many birds tenanted this grove, and were undisturbed by our movements, until Fritz fired and shot a beautiful blue jay and a couple of parakeets, one a brilliant scarlet, the other green and gold. Fritz was in the act of reloading his gun, when an unaccountable noise struck our ears, and put us instantly on the alert, because it appeared like the dull thumping sound of a muffled drum, and reminded us of the possible presence of savages. With the greatest caution we drew near the sound, concealing ourselves among the low bushes and thick grass and creepers, until we reached an open glade, where, standing on an old prostrate log, was a beautiful bird, about the size of a cock, of a rich chestnut-brown colour, finely mottled with dark brown and grey. On the shoulders were curious tufts of velvety black feathers, glossed with green. He was ruffling his wings, erecting his tail and neck feathers, strutting and wheeling about in a most strange and stately fashion. After manoeuvring for some time in this manner, greatly to the edification of a party of birds resembling him, but without any ruff, who, assembled round the stump, were enjoying his performances, he spread out his tail like a fan, stiffened his wings, and began to strike with them in short, rapid beats, faster and faster, until a rumbling sound very like distant thunder was produced, and the whirring wings enveloped him as in a cloud. This was the drumming noise which had alarmed us, increased, as I imagine, by the wing-strokes falling at times on the decayed and hollow stump on which the curious pantomime was acted. I was watching it with the utmost interest, when a shot from behind me was fired, and in a moment the play was at an end. My over-hasty son had changed the pretty comedy into a sad and needless tragedy. The enthusiastic drummer fell dead from his perch, and the crowd of admiring companions fled in dismay. The cruel interruption of a scene so rare and remarkable annoyed me extremely, and I blamed Fritz for firing without my leave. I felt sure the bird was the ruffled grouse, and a very fine specimen. We placed it on the ass, which was patiently awaiting our return, and went on our way. The sledge was quite safe where we had left it. It was early in the day, and I resolved to explore, as I had intended, a line of cliff and rocky hills which, at more or less distance from the seashore, extended the whole length of coast known or visible to us. I desired to discover an opening, if any existed, by which to penetrate the interior of the country, or to ascertain positively that we were walled in and isolated on this portion of the coast. Leaving Calabash Wood behind us, we advanced over ground covered with manioc, potatoes, and many plants unknown to us. Pleasant streamlets watered the fruitful soil, and the view on all sides was open and agreeable. Some bushes attracted my notice, loaded with small white berries, of peculiar appearance like wax, and very sticky when plucked. I recognized in this a plant called by botanists Myrica serifera, and with much pleasure explained to Fritz that, by melting and straining these berries, we might easily succeed in making candles, and afford very great satisfaction to the mother, who did not at all approve of having to lay her work aside and retire to rest, the moment the sun set. The greenish wax to be obtained would be more brittle than beeswax, but it would burn very fairly, and diffuse an agreeable perfume. Having the ass with us, we lost no time in gathering berries enough to fill one of the large canvas bags he carried, and we then continued our route. Very soon we met with another natural curiosity, the curious appearance of which surprised us much. This was the abode, under one roof, of a whole colony of birds, about the size of yellow hammers, 
but of plain brown plumage. The nests were built in a mass round the stem, and among the branches of a tree standing alone, and a kind of roof formed of grass, straws, and fibres covered them all, and sheltered the community from rain and the heat of the sun. There were numbers of openings into the irregular sides of the group of dwellings, the nests resembling different apartments in a house common to all. Twigs and small branches emerged here and there from the walls, and served as perches for the young birds, and resting places and posts of observation for all. The general appearance of the establishment reminded us of a huge bath-sponge. The feathered inhabitants swarmed in and out by thousands, and we saw among them many beautiful little parrots, who seemed in many instances to contest possession of the nest with the lawful owners. Fritz, being an expert climber, and exceedingly anxious to examine the nests more closely, ascended the tree, hoping to obtain one or two young birds, if any were hatched. He put his hand into several holes, which were empty, but at last his intended theft and robbery met with repulse and chastisement he little expected, for, reaching far back into the nest, his finger was seized and sharply bitten by a very strong beak, so that with a cry he withdrew his hand and shook it vigorously to lessen the pain. Recovering from the surprise, he again and more resolutely seized the unkind bird, and, despite its shrieks and screams, drew it from its retreat, crammed it into his pocket, buttoned up his coat, and slid quickly to the ground, pursued by numbers of the captive's relatives, who darted from the other holes, and flew round the robber, screeching and pecking at him in a rage. Fritz's prize was not one of the real owners of the nests, which were those of the sociable Grosbeak, but a very pretty small green parrot, with which he was greatly pleased, and which he at once determined to tame and teach to speak. For the present it was carefully remanded to prison in his pocket. This curious colony of birds afforded us matter for conversation as we went on our way. Their cheerful sociable habits, and the instinct which prompted them to unite in labour for the common good, appearing most wonderful to us. Examples of the kind, however, said I, are numerous in various classes of animals. Beavers, for instance, build and live together in a very remarkable way. Among insects, bees, wasps, and ants are well known as social architects. In like manner the coral insect works wonders beneath the ocean waves, by force of perseverance and united effort. "'I have often watched ants at work,' said Fritz. "'It is most amusing to see how they carry on the various works and duties of their commonwealth.' "'Have you ever noticed how much trouble they take with the eggs?' inquired I, to see how far he understood the process." "'carrying them about in the warmth of the sun until they are hatched? "'Ah, that is rather the chrysalis of the ant-worm, "'or larva which is produced from an egg. "'I know they are called ants' eggs, but, strictly speaking, that is incorrect. "'You are perfectly right, my boy. "'Well, if you have taken so much interest in watching the little ants of your native country, "'how delighted and astonished you would be to see the wonders performed "'by the vast tribes of large ants in foreign lands.' Some of these build heaps or nests, four or six feet high and proportionately broad, which are so strong and firm that they defy equally sunshine and rain. They are within divided into regular streets, galleries, vaults, and nurseries. So firmly are these mounds built that, with interior alterations, a deserted one might be used for a baking oven. The ant, although respected since the days of King Solomon as a model of industry, is not in itself an attractive insect. It exudes a sticky moisture, its smell is unpleasant, and it destroys and devours whatever eatable comes in its way. Although in our own country it does little harm, the large ants of foreign lands are most destructive and troublesome, it being very difficult to check their depredations. Fortunately they have enemies by whose exertions their numbers are kept down. Birds, other insects, and even four-footed beasts prey upon them. Chief among the latter is the ant-bear, or taminoir, of South America, a large creature six or seven feet in length, covered with long coarse hair, drooping like a heavy plume over the hindquarters. The head is wonderfully elongated and very narrow. It is destitute of teeth, and the tongue resembles somewhat a great red earthworm. 
It has immensely strong curved claws, with which it tears and breaks down and scratches to pieces the hard walls of the ant heaps. Then, protruding its sticky tongue, it coils and twists it about among the terrified millions disturbed by its attack. They adhere to this horrible invader and are drawn irresistibly backward into the hungry, toothless jaws awaiting them. The little ant eater is not more than about twenty one inches in length, has a shorter and more natural looking head, and fine silky fur. It usually lives in trees. I was pleased to find my memory served me so well on this subject, as it interested my boy amazingly, and occupied us for a considerable time while we travelled onward. Arriving presently at a grove of tall trees, with very strong, broad, thick leaves, we paused to examine them. They bore a round, fig-like fruit, full of little seeds, and of a sour, harsh taste. Fritz saw some gummy resin exuding from cracks in the bark, and it reminded him of the boyish delight afforded by collecting gum from cherry-trees at home, so that he must needs stop to scrape off as much as he could. He rejoined me presently, attempting to soften what he had collected in his hands, but, finding it would not work like gum, he was about to fling it away, when he suddenly found that he could stretch it, and that it sprang back to its original size. "'Oh, father, only look! This gum is quite elastic! Can it possibly be India-rubber?' "'What?' cried I. "'Let me see it! A valuable discovery that would be indeed! And I do believe you are perfectly right!' "'Why would it be so very valuable, father?' inquired Fritz. "'I have only seen it used for rubbing out pencil-marks.' "'India rubber,' I replied, "'or, more properly, caoutchouc, "'is a milky, resinous juice which flows from certain trees "'in considerable quantities when the stem is purposely tapped. "'These trees are indigenous to the South American countries "'of Brazil, Guiana, and Cayenne. "'The natives who first obtained it "'used to form bottles by smearing earthen flasks "'with repeated coatings of the gum "'when just fresh from the trees, "'and, when hardened and sufficiently thick, they broke the mould, shook out the fragments, and hung the bottles in the smoke, when they became firmer and of a dark colour. While moist, the savages were in the habit of drawing rude figures and lines on the resin by way of ornament. These marks you may have observed, for the bottles obtained from the natives by the Spaniards and Portuguese have for years been brought to Europe, and cut into portions to be sold for use in drawing." Couchoke can be put to many uses, and I am delighted to have it here, as we shall, I hope, be able to make it into different forms. First and foremost, I shall try to manufacture boots and shoes. Soon after making this discovery, we reached the coconut wood, and saw the bay extending before us, and the great promontory we called Cape Disappointment, which hitherto had always bounded our excursions. In passing through the wood, I remarked a smaller sort of palm, which, among its grand companions, I had not previously noticed. One of these had been broken by the wind, and I saw that the pith had a peculiar mealy appearance, and I felt convinced that this was the world-renowned sago palm. In the pith I saw some fat worms or maggots, and suddenly recollected that I had heard of them before as feeding on the sago, and that in the West Indies they are eaten as a delicacy. I felt inclined to try what they tasted like, so at once kindling a fire, and placing some half-dozen, sprinkled with salt, on a little wooden spit, I set them to roast. Very soon rich fat began to drop from them, and they smelt so temptingly good that all repugnance to the idea of eating worms vanished, and, putting one like a pat of butter on a baked potato, I boldly swallowed it, and liked it so much that several others followed in the same way. Fritz also summoned courage to partake of this novel food, which was a savoury addition to our dinner of baked potatoes. Being once more ready to start, we found so dense a thicket in the direct route that we turned aside without attempting to penetrate it, and made our way toward the sugar break near Cape Disappointment. This we could not pass without cutting a handsome bundle of sugar canes, and the donkey carried that, in addition to the bag of wax berries. In time we reached the sledge in Calabash Wood, the ass was unloaded, everything placed on the sledge, and our patient beast began calmly and readily to drag the burden he had hitherto borne on his back. No further adventure befell us, and we arrived in the evening at Falconhurst, 
where our welcome was as warm as usual. All we had to tell, listened to with the greatest interest, all we had to show most eagerly examined, the pretty green parakeet enchanting the boys most particularly. An excellent supper was ready for us, and with thankful hearts we enjoyed it together. Then, ascending to our tree-castle, and drawing up the ladder after us, we betook ourselves to the repose well earned, and greatly needed, after this fatiguing day. The idea of candle-making seemed to have taken the fancy of all the boys, and next morning they woke, one after the other, with the word candle on their lips. When they were thoroughly roused, they continued to talk candles. All breakfast-time, candles were the subject of conversation, and after breakfast they would hear of nothing else but setting to work at once, and making candles. "'So be it,' said I. "'Let us become chandlers.' I spoke confidently, but, to tell the truth, I had in my own mind certain misgivings as to the result of our experiment. In the first place I knew that we lacked a very important ingredient, animal fat, which is necessary to make candles burn for any length of time with brilliancy. Besides this I rather doubted how far my memory would recall the various operations necessary in the manufacture. Of all this, however, I said nothing, and the boys under my direction were soon at work. We first picked off the berries, and threw them into a large, shallow iron vessel placed on the fire. The green, sweet-scented wax was rapidly melted, rising to the surface of the juice yielded by the berries. This we skimmed off, and placed in a separate pot by the fire, ready for use. Repeating the operation several times, until we had collected sufficient liquid wax for our purpose. I then took the wicks my wife had prepared, and dipped them one after the other into the wax handing them as I did so to Fritz, who hung them up on a bush to dry. The coating they thus obtained was not very thick, but by repeating the operation several times, they at length assumed very fair proportions, and became real sturdy candles. Our wax being at an end, we hung these in a cool shady place to harden, and that same night we sat up like civilized beings, three whole hours after sunset, and Falconhurst was for the first time brilliantly illuminated. We were all delighted with the success of our experiment. "'You are indeed clever,' said my wife. "'I only wish that with your ingenuity you would show me how to make butter. Day after day I have the annoyance of seeing a large supply of good cream go bad under my very eyes, simply because I have no use to which to put it. Invent a plan. Please do.' "'I think that perhaps I can help you,' I replied, after a little consideration. "'Not that I can claim the honour of the invention of my plan. That is due to the Hottentots. I will see what I can do. Jack, bring me one of our gourd bottles.' I took the gourd, one of those I had previously prepared, with a small hole at one end, and well hollowed out and cleaned. This I partially filled with cream, and then corked up the hole tightly. "'Here, boys,' said I, you can continue the operation while I turn carpenter and make a cart to take the place of our sledge. I gave them their directions, and then set about my own work. They fixed four posts in the ground, and to them fastened a square piece of sailcloth by four cords attached to the corners. In this cradle they placed the gourd of cream, and each taking a side, rolled it backward and forward continuously for half an hour. Now, I cried, looking up from my work, open the gourd, and take the contents to your mother, with my compliments. They did so, and my good wife's eyes were delighted with the sight of a large lump of capital fresh butter. With my son's assistance the cart was in time completed. A clumsy vehicle it was, but strong enough for any purpose to which we might put it, and, as it proved, of immense use to us in collecting the harvest." We then turned our attention to our fruit-trees, which we had planted in a plot, ready for transplanting. The walnut, cherry, and chestnut-trees we arranged in parallel rows, so as to form a shady avenue from Falconhurst to Family Bridge, and between them we laid down a tolerable road, that we might have no difficulty in reaching Tentholm, be the weather bad as it might. We planted the vines round the arched roots of our great mangrove, and the rest of the trees in suitable spots some near Falconhurst, and others away over Jackal River, to adorn Tentholm. 
Tentholm had been the subject of serious thoughts to me for some time past, and I now turned all my attention thither. It was not my ambition to make it beautiful, but to form of it a safe place of refuge in a case of emergency. My first care, therefore, was to plant a thick prickly hedge capable of protecting us from any wild animal, and forming a tolerable obstacle to the attack of even savages, should they appear. Not satisfied with this, however, we fortified the bridge, and on a couple of hillocks mounted two guns which we brought from the wreck, and with whose angry mouths we might bark defiance at any enemy, man or beast. Six weeks slipped away while we were thus busily occupied, six weeks of hard yet pleasant labour. We greeted each Sunday and its accompanying rest most gratefully, and on that day always especially thanked God for our continued health and safety. I soon saw that this hard work was developing in the boys remarkable strength, and this I encouraged by making them practice running, leaping, climbing, and swimming. I also saw, however, that it was having a less satisfactory effect upon their clothes, which, though a short time before remarkably neat, were now, in spite of the busy mother's mending and patching, most untidy and disreputable. I determined, therefore, to pay another visit to the wreck, to replenish our wardrobe, and to see how much longer the vessel was likely to hold together. Three of the boys and I went off in the pinnace. The old ship seemed in much the same condition as when we had left her. A few more planks had gone, but that was all. "'Come, boys,' cried I, not an article of the slightest value must be left on board. Rummage her out to the very bottom of her hold. They took me at my word. Sailors' chests, bales of cloth and linen, a couple of small guns, ball and shot, tables, benches, window shutters, bolts and locks, barrels of pitch, all were soon in a heap on the deck. We loaded the pinnace and went on shore. We soon returned with our tub-boat in tow, and after a few more trips— nothing was left on board. "'One more trip,' said I to my wife, before we started again, "'and there will be the end of the brave ship which carried us from Switzerland. I have left two barrels of gunpowder on board, and mean to blow her up.' Before we lighted the fusee I discovered a large copper cauldron which I thought I might save. I made fast to it a couple of empty casks, that when the ship went up it might float.' The barrels were placed, the train lighted, and we returned on shore. The supper was laid outside the tent, at a spot from whence we might obtain a good view of the wreck. Darkness came on. Suddenly a vivid pillar of fire rose from the black waters, a sullen roar boomed across the sea, and we knew that our good old ship was no more. We had planned the destruction of the vessel, we knew that it was for the best, and yet that night we went to bed with a feeling of sadness in our hearts, as though we had lost a dear old friend. End of chapter 7 part 1 Read by Kara Schallenberg on July 17, 2009 in San Diego, California